The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities that they represent. This program is intended for educational purposes. You're listening to Aap sun rahe hain Tum suno tha Main lag gaya kitna tha kelta idira Radio 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 Azim Prem ji University Over the last 5 episodes we've been privy to some of the lesser heard and until now undocumented stories of how India emerged not only independent from British rule but came together as a composite nation of hundreds of kingdoms and principalities On the concluding episodes of the first season of the India project we revisit some of these stories and take stock of what happened to some of the characters we encountered Welcome to the India project At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. The India Project with Josie Joseph and Sheetal. Episode 6, The Road to Destiny. So you've heard the last five episodes of The India Project. and like you i have as well and in many ways i am you i am in fact that question that you have in your mind with respect to a particular character who might have caught your imagination or a particular moment that we brought alive through those uh, five episodes for a name i can give you a name my name is sheetal and i'm here as a personification of some of those questions as someone who's interested in that particular chapter of uh, indian history So yes the answer comes to us in the form of guess who <laughs> Josie himself is here to help us tie up some of the loose ends and perhaps point our eyes in the direction or ears in the direction of the next chapter of India's history as a republic Josie have to say master storytelling through the last 5 episodes you've kind of brought us to these you know cliff hangers through those 5 and i think there are plenty of questions in people's minds but i i want to start with one main question why these princely states no it just said uh, we thought that we'll pick up some of the most interesting and maybe uh, uh, quirky characters mm-hmm. fundamentally the very project started as a research long ago by my team because uh, i think uh, we haven't uh, and our public doesn't know enough about how this complex democracy came about mm. you know josie since you mentioned how difficult it was to bring this democracy together i'm beginning to wonder because you know cp was doing some great work advising uh, the ruler of travancore and there was a lot that it had going for it and yet we do know now that things didn't really work out that way did cp simply get scared that the onus or the responsibility of running travancore was a daunting one somehow that his ruler would not be up to or was he just fearful of the fate of anyone who uh, batted for that point of view uh, to be the same as what he had encountered in an attempted assassination attempt so tell us what happened there no i think the attack on him on july 25th very clearly rattled him and i think that was a turning point and it's very unfortunate right that uh, that kcs money the young militant insurgent who attacked him uh has not found enough celebratory acceptance in the annals of indian history mm. not that we are justifying violence but the fact is that he should be ranked alongside bhagat singh mm. and uh, others and subhash chandra bose and others who have contributed dramatically to the cause of independence of uh, united india hmm. so i think the attack really rattled him and that's when he really shifts a gear to tell his uh, ruler that sir uh, i don't think anyone of us is safe hmm. but i know and feel that such a fight will be a fight against concentrated hatred and venom and there will be successive attempts on my life and on yours if you keep me with you if i'm killed or incapacitated at the present juncture there is no one to replace me by force of all these if not for the attack despite the huge public protest that was surging outside i think cp would have pulled off an independent travancore right for a host of reasons including the fact that he was not a lone ranger he was the founder head of network of very powerful 
princely states which enjoyed significant patronage in London and other parts of the world. Right. So it it wasn't that from a geostrategic point of view, hmm. it was not a madman's dream. Hmm. It was a possibility. Yeah. And uh, once you have absolute power, then suppressing dissent, etc., becomes easy. And we have seen it in many countries across Africa and other places. How or in South Asia? Correct. Hmm. I mean, except for India, look at the rest of South Asia. Uh, once the ruler has absolute power as as a sovereign and as a an, uh, nation state, then suppressing dissent is very easy. So yeah, Josie. So while on the subject of CP, you want to dwell a little bit more because it segues into what happened in Indore. Because at one you know, point in time, CP is here telling his ruler, uh, not a very good idea to branch out on your own. On the other hand, Yashwant Rao Holkar of Indore, with his own advisors, is now sending out a note to CP. A Hindu one. I beg of you, with all the emphasis at my command, not to turn down this very sincere offer on He's saying, my hey, you know, why don't you hop across and help me <laughs> strike out on my own? Um, what really happened over here? Because uh, clearly he's reaching out to a man who had just advised his own ruler in Travancore not to follow that path. Was uh, Holkar aware of what had transpired in Travancore or I'm, am I presuming something here? Can you tell us what really transpired? Uh, no, I mean, basically, uh, CP on 27th, when it tells the Travancore Maharaja, that we should not pursue freedom, independence. He also tells him in that letter that please inform our friends. Hmm. Whatever decision is taken, we must inform Hyderabad and Bhopal. And I suspect hmm. that there was a secret communication network among Travancore, even Mysore, uh, Nizam, hmm. Bhopal, Indore, Junagad, etc. And it was a quite a organized conspiracy hmm. and CP was at the head of it. Hmm. And in fact, uh, we, we do hear uh, Bhopal's Hamidullah calling him right. our most important advisor, etc. So, Holkar writes to CP just as he hears that Travan Guru is giving up its independence dream. Hmm. And that's when he writes saying that, look, come to me. I mean, I want to be independent. Hmm. So, so and, and, and Holkar's move could have been a master stroke. Hmm. If CP had accepted, correct, because then CP would have been far closer to the center of action. He would have had Bhopal next door. He would have Jinnah would have been much closer to him, and there is Nizam. We would have had chaos uh, of uh, of the scale that we can't imagine today. Uh, and while you know we are on the subject of uh, people having these cloak and dagger meetings, etc., there was one man who we heard in your story from Bhopal, Hamidullah, who's writing to Jinnah asking, nearly pleading and begging about his uh, future in Pakistan. Tell us about what really transpired in that story a little bit more to understand why he was so desperate to ally with uh, Pakistan. If uh, alignment to one dominion, why this one and not that? Hamidullah has always been invested in the idea of Pakistan. Hmm. And that is why a uh, large part of the Bhopal royal family finally ended up in uh, Pakistan. Pakistan. Uh, but it's not just Hamidullah who is consulting Jinnah. Hmm. Uh, Nizam is also closely coordinating with Jinnah. Hmm. Uh, so is the Junagadh ruler. Hmm. Uh, uh, so does a few of the Hindu ruling families like Holkar and others. Hmm. So Jinnah was this rallying point for anyone who was not interested in being part of the dominion of India, which was determined to be a republic. Hmm. Whereas Jinnah, who, has, who had to deal with just three, four princely states, uh, was of the opinion that on 15th of August, all of you are going to be independent. Hmm. You can decide the course of action. Right. And so they felt more comfortable in Jinnah's words, hmm. as we know from the Jodhpur episode. Right. It's probably August 10th uh, when uh, Jodhpur Maharaja, who had left Delhi after agreeing to everything that Patel and Viceroy said, he returned. And on the 10th when he returns, there is uh, dramatic moments happening. The Nawab of Bhopal sends two cars to both the airfields of Delhi. He just wanted to ensure that the Maharaja is with him. Mountbatten later said that uh, probably Nawab was holding the Jodhpur ruler as a prisoner in his house. Whatever it is, the Jodhpur ruler meets Jinnah. And uh, Jinnah is famously, as you know, said to have told the Jodhpur ruler, here is my fountain pen, write your terms and I will sign it. Uh, so I think they were looking at to, up to him for 
uh, a political support and a certain kind of freedom that he was offering hmm. uh, and if traven guru had not pulled out we may have had a corridor of independent princely states starting from traven guru mysore all the way down to junagadh hmm. stretching across the heart of india right right so the nawab to 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 answer your question what nawab was doing was not in isolation hmm. we do see people like nizam also right. in fact nizam before he uh, makes his announcements he won would often send his letters to jinnah to approve right that was a kind of close coordination they had mm-hmm. i must here add one more thing mm-hmm. it's not that all the muslim rulers were coordinating with jinnah mm-hmm. and was with jinnah the most interesting being rampur mm-hmm. who had who knew geographically and politically he and his people should belong to india because it's in uttar pradesh but what muslim league does is that they unleash violence uh, in rampur to force the rampur raja to change his position hmm. he doesn't he ends up in mountbatten's house seeking for help and mountbatten rushes military to quell, to quell the, the protest, protest. Mm-hmm. so when we talk about the idea of you know pakistan india and the independent the princely states it's not just a hindu muslim uh, division mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it is a division between uh, people who are power hungry mm-hmm. who find uh, assurance in jinnah and uh, rulers who are very comfortable in the idea of uh, republic, republic of india mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and on both sides we have hindus and muslims yeah so that symbolistic narrative that has been built into our uh, textbooks and uh, many of our writings is absolutely rubbish mm-hmm. Now you know Josie I'm taking my role as the question mark on this episode very seriously and this is other question that begs to be asked and I'm going to bring it in here before we get to other topics this has to do with the idea of a republic um why was this idea of a republic or a democracy so important to our collective psyche was it something like you know you've stood together to fight the external colonizers so might as well stand together as one going forward into the future as well or was there something else that prompted some of these princely states to buy into the idea of a republic because by every stretch of uh, you know understanding or with all the data that we have clearly they were doing well even as princely states what was in it for them to be part of a republic i think there are two three factors is one is that for sure uh, that period india sees the birth and maturing of some of the greatest minds in human history mahatma gandhi pandit nehru sardar patel b r ambedkar etc 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 it's almost a collection of geniuses hmm. so they were truly inspirational figures and they articulated the idea of republic and democracy in such uh, appealing manner hmm. that many of the rulers and their divans fell for it hmm. and and they're almost uh, uh, yeah they they were almost captivated by that idea hmm. second do not forget the fact that the princely states ever since east india company came in and began to expand and then british empire took over it's not that princely states are completely free hmm. they were uh, vassals right basically right. they were signing in all kinds of agreements uh, it was a uh, british empire which decided who the next ruler should be he would remove the rulers if they don't like them like hmm. holkar's father was removed was to remove step down uh, so it was at the whims and fancies of the british empire that uh, princely states were hmm. except for the internal administrative purposes even there the 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 princely the the empire had sent uh, residents right hmm. who were like the watchers and advisers right so it is not that the so so many of the rulers uh, resented the fact that they were being suppressed or they were being choked by the british control hmm. so that's also another factor why they were appealing and they were more excited by the idea of uh, republic. the republic hmm. there is a third factor and which is that one we must actually celebrate and talk more about which is that for centuries india had become a very unique lands landscape uh, thanks to a lot of factors including our geographical location migration yeah the invasions uh, missionaries all kinds of things that we had become a very complex society where hindus muslims buddhists christians everyone co- cohabited hmm. and the power of living together celebrating the diversity was very appealing to the enlightened minds of many of the rulers mm-hmm. and and many of them like akbar began to emphasize and uh, 
further spread that message and celebrate that message mm. for all of them the idea of india a republic a secular republic became far more appealing than even becoming remaining an independent kingdom mm. or joining an religion based uh, uh, pakistan mm-hmm. Josie, I'm thinking we'll take a small little break over here and let our listeners wrap their heads around that idea of India. We'll be back. Uh, stay with us on episode six of the India Project with Josie Joseph. Coming up on the other side of the break. Eighty-four thousand Japanese troops poured into India from Burma in March 1944. With the Indian National Army, they aimed to take Imphal and then move west to march on Delhi. Let us say there are twenty mangoes. I know it's twenty because I'm counting in base ten. But if I was counting in base nine, I would say I have two two mangoes. What does that mean? I have two into nine plus two mangoes. I is, have two two be... mangoes. But if you are an Indian, uh, that's how you say two in base ten. I have two two mangoes. <laughs> <laughs> It's a math, math, math world with Divakaran and Shraddha. Out now, only on Radio Azim Premji University. The Northeast that forms an entire episode. I wanted to understand why it was important to include Hyderi and uh, what transpired in the Northeast. to complete our understanding of the events that led to the 15th of august 1947 i do understand that the northeast was of strategic importance but i think uh, other than that are there any other points that you would like to bring up uh, if i had not included northeast i would have been falling into the same trap that many of our writers and policy makers have fallen to mm. so take the last 100 years of indian subcontinent or take the world for that matter one of the greatest battles that decided the fate of the world hmm. whether it is the fascist japan japanese german italian axis uh, who is going to rule the world or is it democratic values was actually largely decided in the hills of northeast hmm. when the japanese force and the british fought 84000 japanese troops poured into india from burma in march 1944 With the Indian National Army, they aimed to take Imphal and then move west to march on Delhi. They simultaneously attacked Kohima, a hill garrison on the road to the railway at Dimapur. The Japanese had expected their opponents to quickly surrender. They didn't. The troops had travelled light, expecting to plunder Allied stores when they defeated them. The gamble. didn't pay off instead the japanese fought on sick and starving by contrast the allies enjoyed control of the skies and their supplies the troops in imphal were all supplied by air the air battle of imphal was as much as important as the battle on land the japanese supply lines were overstretched nothing got to them by land or air their plight was most acute at kohima it was the monsoon the leeches the the malaria they were reduced in the end to boiling grass in water and that was their sustenance the commander was forced to do what no japanese commander had ever done he withdrew his troops you look at the last 75 years of india its biggest military humiliation happened in the northeast largely right so if we don't make the effort to understanding the strategic importance of that region and the diversity of the region then we are being ignorant we are not we are not really understanding the idea of india and uh, it breaks it should break our hearts to see that uh, the army that was sent in to suppress the naga rebellion is still there and i don't think anywhere in the world uh, a military of a democratic country has stayed on in domestic security duties for so, such a long time uh, you know statistically uh, after second world war the average life span of an insurgency had, has been 8 to 10 12 years but look at uh, us and that that speaks a volumes about the ignorance of the political leaders and policy makers in new delhi about 
നോർത്ത് ഈസ്റ്റ് ഹൗ ഡെലിവറിഡ്ലി ദ ഇഗ്നോർ ഇറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ദെയർ ലാക്ക് ഓഫ് വിൽ ആൻഡ് എബിലിറ്റി ടു സോൾവ് ദ ഇഷ്യൂസ് ആൻഡ് and bring the people together and and celebrate the diversity hmm right so just like the northeast right i'm sure there are others that uh, you thought i mean northeast you thought prudent to include but i'm sure there are others who are also interesting interesting stories of princely states that don't make the cut but i'm sure our listeners would be curious to know for example what happened uh, to jammu and kashmir um we know we've read probably one of the most documented stories of what really happened on account of how it still um, has something to do with our reality today uh, so some of these other parallel stories if you could just touch upon for a little bit would be good for us to complete the picture see among all the princely states i think the the one who had the capability and the financial muscle power and the global reach to secure his independence was nizam and hyderabad was in the heart of india uh, if they had remained independent it would have looked like somebody pierced a knife deep into india's heart and you know took out that hard part so he had challenges obviously he was landlocked by india but he was not a small princely state he was big really big he was then the richest guy in the world he had his own airline he had his own military capabilities and he had some of the world's best advisors to advise him uh, and very strangely he had two things which were deadly one that though muslims were a minority in hyderabad his administration was packed with uh, muslims uh, so the, the and and then there was a militia that was fully loyal to him so he was sitting pretty good and uh, he also enjoyed uh, great rapport and support in london and among the conservative uh, political class there as august begins what we see is that uh, he is stepping up his game he is sending emissaries to karachi and mind you because he has got his own aircraft he doesn't need to bother about india so he's flying in and out his emissaries he has mungton who is a british legendary lawyer who is a friends of viceroy mountbatten to winston churchill and others uh he's also sending he also sends his a uh, commander of his military forces by air abroad uh the suspicion was that the commander was going to switzerland to buy weapons for the military so despite all the efforts by viceroy and uh, all kinds of noises being made by others nizam doesn't move and nizam as you know after viceroy announced the plan to partition india on june 3 Nizam alongside Travancore Nizam is one of the early ones who showed Farman for about his independence. Hmm, a Farman which uh, for the benefit of our listeners refers to a decree or an edict in Urdu. Uh yeah, continue, continue Josie. Uh all the mount baron efforts after that through July early August nothing works and by finally on 14th of August Nizam sends a telegram to Delhi to Viceroy saying that I am not going to sign the instrument of accession. Hmm. Now let's come to Kashmir for a bit over here Josie because interesting that after the British left the Indian subcontinent metaphorically speaking on the 14th of August 1947 one hears that the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir had remained independent for some 70 plus days. So tell us the position of that princely state around the time that all of this was happening. Kashmir is actually very interesting both Nehru and Gandhi through the summer are quite obsessed about Kashmir. Nehru is very emotional about it. Gandhi is also because uh, Sheikh Abdullah one of the most popular leaders and they're one of their favorites. He is in jail and uh, the the ruler and his prime divan prime minister they're trying to stir up communal tensions and uh, there is disquiet. So Nehru says he wants to go to Kashmir. Gandhi says he would like to go to Kashmir. to prepare for nehru strip so mount batten realized it's going to be tricky so he went to call some meeting of nehru gandhi patel and himself so four of the meet and patel finally says actually gandhi going is a lesser of the evil and so instead of nehru gandhi goes where raval pindi and uh, he is received by sheik abdullah's wife and a group of women and gandhi respecting the rulers order not have any public meetings etc he doesn't hold any public prayer meetings or anything but they do hold prayer meetings but not make doesn't make any political statement or any large rallies or anything and that gandhi visit actually remains a very emotional point for kashmiris even today many of them still talk about that again kashmir remains in the position that they will 
enter into treaty agreements with both sides and they're quiet there is there is a very strange silence from there emanating and that silence will all erupt in the coming weeks mm. after the 15th of august right so that was kashmir and uh, josie in an earlier episode you'd mentioned rasul khan ji of junagadh the dog lover right we all remember that one uh, but yes he was quite looking forward to this meeting with jinnah so that story is kind of incomplete in my head where was junagadh at this given point of time so junagadh is strategically located again very important seashore very close to pakistan and uh, the state department is in touch with the junagadh administration and uh, even up until 13th of august they had sent a telegram asking them to send back the signed instrument of accession copy and 14th evening nobody knows what junagadh has done hmm. only a day later we would realize that they had joined pakistan already by the 11th or the 12th of august so josie the picture that i'm getting right now is that of the princely states uh, main players not so main players etc and where they stand and we are already somewhere near the 14th of august 1947 and what's troubling to my ears is that we still don't have a complete country we still have a lot of people who haven't yet bought into the idea of a republic which means balkanization is quite a real threat um in light of that let's look at the other point of view the states committee had a huge role in uh moving us every day towards uh, you know being a nation an independent nation so tell us about really what happened within the states committee how was it formed you've given us some perspective but uh to understand these heroes or this particular hero in the name of the states committee would be important the political department which is a department of the british empire was officially coming to an end with the end of british empire so states department by just appointing patel as a minister and menon as secretary the department was not shaping taking shape mm-hmm. it has to be a headquarters in delhi with offices across india mm-hmm. and it was a, a massive network to emerge so what they did was uh, they started identifying key officials who could man uh, this place and the first person that they identified was cc deshai mm-hmm. was a classmate of subhash chandra bose in cambridge mm-hmm. and who was in ics he was the uh, chairman of the tariff board in uh, bombay he was in very keen to move because he was having a good life and happy life there but patel forced him to come and uh, as you see in the last in the run up to independence and later deshai becomes the key anchoring figure of the state department mm-hmm. while patel and menon are talking to the rulers and running around and uh menon is traveling a lot after independence it's deshai who is the anchoring position there hmm. joining him is mn buch mn buch was also an ics officer he was in punjab as civil supply secretary when the partition chaos are beginning hmm. so he doesn't come till august 10th and he comes by 10th and and immediately gets down to the task especially of the western indian region hmm. where as you know not just Uh, all these big princely states there are also many hundreds of unattached states smaller ones but when they asked for buch to come and join in july he couldn't come uh, and they agreed with the uh, argument about punjab so they identified uh, another official from the political department called banes singh ji and he is now sent to rajkot where he is setting up office and talking to all the people getting the instrument of accession signed uh, then there is a group of people who are joining the headquarters many of them are from the political department but shifting this side mm. so indian junior officials who are working in political department are mostly joining the states department mm-hmm. but the fact is also that all the files of the political department which were not destroyed and which were not handed over to states department mm. which means the files that contain the family history is there you know shenanigans and uh, the madness and all kinds of conspiracies in the family those files were actually handed over to british high commission hmm. in delhi which sent it to uk and years later it was handed over to india we hmm. believe all of it but uh, so states department is a network hmm. that is operating that has to operate across india hmm. but there is one providence that is happening in 47 because of this entire uh, you know this entire josh about free independence uh, that's coming uh, we have a network of divans 
in many of these princely states who are very very committed to the idea of independent india hmm. sardar k m panikkar in uh, jaipur uh, b l mitter in baroda etc and of them one of them is very interesting uh, mn venkatachar he is in jodhpur so his ruler has a last minute change of heart on the by the first week of august hmm. uh, via mumbai he lands in delhi and nawab of bhopal takes him to jinnah and jinnah offers him a blank check hmm. and says that you declare independence or whatever uh it's a 6th of august if i am not is meeting jinnah and by the 8th of august hmm. venkatachar is writing to delhi secretly saying that you know my role is doing this hmm. when gaikwad is planning uh, having second thoughts in baroda hmm. sitting in mumbai with uh, M- advice of mr jayakar the lawyer bl mitter is reporting it to patel hmm. so does somebody in nizam's uh, administration hmm. there is a very uh, courageous official there who starts who has direct access to nizam and is involved in the running of the administration who starts sending out letters to uh, delhi to almost give real time update about what the nizam and gang are planning hmm. so that network of officials across india becomes and and uh, we must not forget haidari in uh, assam because he is actually the governor of the assam province hmm. he is a british appointed official but he steps up to the moment of situation and on his own he goes out mm. so that network actually helps in many ways state department to take its time to grow mm. if not for that net, that informal network of this very uh, brilliant powerful people committed to the idea of india we may not have it the balkanization would have been further strengthened now i think i feel a bit better with respect to my understanding of the key players uh with respect to that story of the princely states and they are signing up the states committee that was an, a very important component you need to talk about them and you talk about the heroes of our story indeed you can't really entirely call uh, the princely states the villains of the story but certainly you know there was some resistance from several quarters which led to a very real possibility of balkanization and that's where we are at this particular point of time now the next episode we are going to go into the 14th morning and see what really happened in the hours before nehru's historic speech so we'll see you next on the 14th of august 1947 Make sure you check out the show notes where we share the show resources and acknowledgments and don't forget to subscribe or follow our channel for future episodes. On the next episode. You are telling me that on the 14th right until 9 p.m. we don't even have a full country the way we imagine it in our heads today. The session begins with the singing of Vande uh, Mataram. At the stroke of the midnight hour When the world sleeps India will awake to life and freedom You're listening to Aap sun rahe hain Tum suno tha Nengle kekunada Kyu kelta idira Radio Radio Azim Premji University 